do so now. Uh, Caroline Chapin uh, was, was the one who took the initiative and contacted uh, one of our, our presenters this evening, and uh, he reached out to the other, and uh, we will well, first hear this evening from Jim Rasman, who is our Southeast Regional uh, Forester for the DCR. Uh, Jim knows our area extremely well, and uh, he has been in contact, I'm sure, through the years with many of the folks on the call this evening. Um, and so I would like to thank everyone who is attending from uh, our organizations as well as, as others who've, who've gotten the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you this evening and to, to be able to host for our joint communities um, and the larger community uh, this, this presentation. And so I'll pass it to, to Jim and he'll introduce our featured speaker. Thank you, Hampton. Um, my name is Jim Rossman. I'm the Southeast Regional Service Forester. I cover a large area in southeastern Massachusetts um, from Boston over to Foxborough, down to the Rhode Island border, the Cape and Islands. Um, I cover such a large area because uh, the southeastern Massachusetts, we don't have quite the active uh, forestry industry that we have in other parts of the state, but I was previously a state in central Massachusetts, a service forester in central Mass and, and western Mass as well. Um, as a service forester, we provide um, assistance to private landowners, uh, municipalities, land trusts, private landowners, but actually we, I do not work on state land, even though I work for the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, Department of Conservation and Recreation is a large organization. You guys know it, you know, Miles Standish State Forest and many other uh, state facilities, but also um, we manage dams, we do private, this private assistance, we have fire control, we have, uh, you know, firefighters in the, in the DCR, we do urban parks, and then, um, we have uh, a group that Nicole runs um, on forest health. So as a service forester, I'm often the first point of contact that towns or individuals bump into with questions or concerns or, um, and many of those questions I can answer and, and some I cannot. And so um, this is kind of the question, the case with uh, beech leaf disease, since it's a relatively new issue in Massachusetts, we're all kind of coming up to speed on it. Um, Definitely, it was been new to me, and so uh, when Pinewoods reached out to me, and we 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 did some uh, a walk around on their on their property and talked about uh, working with six ponds with this presentation, I quickly reached out to Nicole, who is our uh, Mass DCR Forest Health. Uh, she runs our Forest Health Bureau, um, which looks at the whole Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I'll let Nicole go a little farther into that. But she, we're all on the same umbrella as foresters within DCR. Um, but do very different jobs. So I'm sure to appreciate that she's willing to help us out here tonight and be um, the expert. And I'm gonna be kind of learning along with all of you. Um, the one thing I will say is I am available to meet with private landowners that are concerned. I look at, you know, sick trees. I look at people interested in tax law or interested in wildlife habitat. So anything on private lands, municipal lands, uh, land trust lands, um, I would be the contact for that. And I'll be glad to put my contact information in the chat towards the end of the talk. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Nicole. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so my name is Nicole and I lead our, our state's forest health program. Um, so anything, basically anything bad that's going on with your trees kind of falls into it. So invasive insects, um, diseases, we even investigate a abiotic impacts of things like storm events um, and droughts that can impact our trees. So um, I have a small team, but we're out there across the state. We do work on a lot of our state forests and parks, but we also help out homeowners, um, investigate suspicious activity, uh, work with towns, communities, tree wardens, conservation commissions, uh, other nonprofit landowners like the trustees and Mass Autobahn. Uh, we do a lot of different types of project. Uh, one of the most important is early detection. So as soon as we are able to find something, it's really valuable to get the information as soon as we can so we have more options and are able to uh, approach situations uh, in the, the most aggressive way we can. 
Uh, we do a lot of mapping. So my, my team produces a lot of maps on diseases such as beech leaf disease, but uh, broader impacts across the state. We do have long-term monitoring plots. Uh, we do some treatments on some trees for certain uh, pests such as uh, hemlock willi adelgid and emerald ash borer. And we do release biocontrol species to help control some of these invasives. So uh, my team's always out there doing all different stuff all times of the year. So you can wait, see them out in the forest um, or around your communities and feel free to say hi to them. And I'm gonna like throw a lot of information out there tonight but if you do want to look at stuff or you forget and want to look at a map or more information again, um, this is a link to our forest health story map. Um, so it's a really cool online resource where you can go through and read about specific pests and diseases. It has information about how you can identify it, what some of the things you can do, uh, some of the work my team's been working on and all of our different maps and detections and highlighting areas. So. Um, the QR code works. If not, if you forget this too, you can always Google DCR Forest Health Story Map and you'll be able to find it as well. Or you can always send me an email and I'll, I can send you the link too. So jumping into the, this is basically our newest and kind of the thing that's been taking up my team's most of our time this last year is beech leaf disease. So we it's very new to our state and it is having a very very severe impact um as you guys know living down in the plymouth area it is present and it is um heavily impacting and causing decline in our, our beach forests right now um so it it is able to impact american beach which are our common forested beach and european beach which are our common planted and trees in like our urban forests and our residential areas. Um, it does also infect oriental beach, but it's not always as severe and we really don't have as much oriental beach on our landscape here. Um, it's very rare. It, it's in people's yards or our special planted areas, but our two big ones that we see are American beach and European beach. Um, and American beach has a really big importance in our landscape um, as as part of our forest ecosystems. It's heavily used by birds and other wildlife um, that feed on its, its beech nuts. Uh, and it's, I know that foresters sometimes don't like it. They're always trying to get rid of it and clear it out of their lands, but it is a really important component of our forest and it, it has a really significant ecological function. Um, our European beech uh, have a more of, in our urban forests provide more of a uh, cultural importance we have some really old, really cool beach, uh, such as the, the Longwood Mall beach right now. So we, I see some huge monster European beach that are a couple hundred years old. So these are also being at risk of being lost to this disease. It is not just new here to Massachusetts, but it is newly identified. So it was only first observed in 2012 out in Ohio in their metro parks around the Cleveland area. Um, and one of their parks foresters just noticed the beach were looking really weird. And the first year he was like, oh, maybe it's drought, maybe they're stressed from storms. Next year, they looked even worse. Um, and it took over five years for them to actually identify what was causing this disease. And in those five years, it had spread through multiple states in the Great Lakes area. Um, and then in the last three years, it's spread throughout New England and a lot of our coastal states. So it's moving very rapidly, uh, impacting a huge amount of the Northeast area. So basically, American beach are found kind of from Indi Indiana over and up to Maine and kind of down to like the Georgia area. Um, Western Mass doesn't, or Western United States doesn't really have as much beach, um, but in the area where we do have it in the Northeast, it's moving through it quite quickly. Um, and so when I said they, it was new, they couldn't figure out what was going on. They saw these weird symptoms in their leaves. Uh, they weren't sure if it was uh, insects causing damage. They wasn't sure if it was a bacteria or a virus. Um, and after a lot of testing, a lot of sampling, they finally figured out it was a foliar nematode. Uh, so nematodes are these tiny microscopic round worms and they're present in the buds of the trees and then in the leaves causing this damage. 
And there's still a lot we don't know about beech leaf disease. And one of the things is there, we don't know if there's other microorganisms or pathogens that are also working in tandem with this nematode. Um, but we do know that the nematode is the driving factor in the disease and it is present when we see infections. Um, we don't really know how it moves or spreads. It is, they're very small, they're very light. Um, they can be blown on the wind. We've seen them associated with mites that are on leaves. Uh, we've seen them getting onto birds. We've seen birds feeding on the buds that are full of nematodes. So they're very small, easily dispersed and easily infecting in our trees. Uh, and nematodes, sometimes we have issues with nematodes in like our crops. Um, usually they're more of an issue in, in roots of plants, um, but a, a pathogenic nematode on trees is like unheard of. Um, and a foliar nematode on trees, like there's nothing else that we've ever seen like this. And while they were able to, like nematodes exist on trees all the time, but for a nematode to be doing damage like this is really, really unheard of. So it's something very new uh, and a lot different than the other diseases that we face with our trees. And here in Massachusetts, uh, we first found it in 2020 in Plymouth. Um, I had like gone, heard through the grapevine that someone had something weird going on with their a beach and sent samples to someone in Connecticut, um, but no one knew exactly where the samples came from. And I decided, my team just went out. We're just like, all right, we're just gonna drive around town until we find some beach and see what we can see. And it was, it did not take us long. We were. I think in under two hours, we found it in multiple areas throughout the town. Um, one of the most heavily hit areas was Morton Park. So right along that beach area, there's a, a big beach forest in, in the understory under the pines. And through that residential area leading up to, leading up to the park, uh, there are a lot of uh, planted beach. Also in the cemetery near there, there's a lot of planted beach as well. So it was, by the time we found it, it had probably been at this site for a few years. It was throughout trees, very, very severely impacted throughout multiple areas. Um, and we did find it in, in surrounding towns later that summer as well. So in the next two years, we have identified it in every county in the state in over 90 communities. It's probably in more locations than what we've found it so far, but this is this, these are able, areas we've been able to detect it. Um, we found it in just 70 new towns this year. About half of those came from public reports. So we were spreading the information, getting the word out there, and it really worked. We received hundreds of emails, dozens and dozens of phone calls, uh, and got a lot of really great information and pictures and met up with people out there to check out sites. And so we see it in this area, and I do think it is in more towns than, than we know right now, but it is kind of patchy. Uh, there will be areas where my team and I will park like near a campground and a busy like high use area of a park um, and not see it on any of the trees near there, which is usually where you'd see uh, an, an invasive species come in at an introduction point where people are moving from different areas, coming in from other states, coming in from other towns, um, but we wouldn't see it there. And then we'd hike like two miles into a site and find it like far in the forest on a tree. So it's, it's patchy, it's moving around. It does seem like it's dispersed by something more than just humans. Things like emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle are really commonly moved in wood products. So they move heavily with human assisted movement. This does not seem like it's moving in that similar trend. It does seem like it's likely through wind or, and birds, um, something moving it quicker and, and through larger dispersal areas. So when we look for, when we're out there trying to confirm and find beech leaf disease, um, I'm sure many of you, uh, you've seen this out in your own trees, um, but it's really, easily identified when you're standing under the tree and looking at the leaves um, against a lit background. And you'll see this dark intervenal banding. So between on a leaf between the, the veins, it'll just be an, a continuous dark stripe. And when the disease is new to an area or a newly infected tree, um, you might see only a handful of leaves impacted. So you'll see a couple of leaves 
uh, and each leaf might have a couple of stripes, like two or three stripes. Uh, and then as the disease progresses, you'll see more leaves that are impacted and leaves will start to have more stripes. And as it gets more and more time passes, you get more infection, more nematodes on the site. The whole leaves will just come out like really like shriveled and withered and curled, um, but they won't feel like brittle. They'll actually feel like kind of thick and leathery. Um, and when they're like that, they're just so damaged that a tree cannot use that. It's not photosynthesizing. It's not respirating. It's not transporting water the way it should be. Um, so trees will actually drop these like really thick withered leaves just because they're not useful for them. So sometimes you'll see, um, I will say that the, the symptoms always show up as soon as leaves emerge. So the nematodes are in the buds of the tree over winter. So as the leaves are forming in the buds, the nematodes are already in there causing damage. So as soon as leaves emerge, they already have this, the nematodes present and they have that damage in them. So you'll see in, in June, these like really terrible looking leaves. And then sometimes the trees will actually drop those leaves. And then if the tree is healthy enough, has enough energy, uh, strong enough, it'll push out a secondary flush of leaves. And those ones will actually be like kind of thinner and they won't look like a typical beech leaf. They'll have like a little bit different of a shape to them. Uh, and they're not as, as good. They're not, uh, they're kind of like a rush job. Like trees usually spend a lot more time making a leaf. So when they're doing this, um, it takes a lot of resources from them. Um, and so you kind of see as the disease progresses, um, you'll see more, more of the leaves getting these more withered. Um, and eventually you'll just have parts of the tree that just aren't really pushing out leaves at all. And you'll start to see significant canopy die back um, from there. So these pictures are actually from 2020 when we first found it in Plymouth. So by the time we actually found it, it was already causing a severe decline in both these planted European beech and these American beech in the forested area. So it is, it was well established and had spread throughout the area. And then this is this year in those same stands. Um, and it was so severe that when there's so many nematodes in those buds, the leaves are so deformed that they don't even break out and emerge just because they're, they're just totally non-functional. Um, and even though those buds won't come out, sometimes you will see if, if the tree is healthy enough, has enough uh, energy stored in its roots, it will push out these, these secondary leaves. So they'll be smaller, thinner, um, and kind of below the buds where, you, where we normally would see leaves coming out. And when you actually start looking at, at your beech trees, there's, there's a lot of other things going on. All, every tree has different um, funguses and bacteria and insects associated with that. Um, and a lot of them are native. And sometimes we also have non-natives that aren't really that detrimental. They're just like around on our trees. But we do have a lot of other things feeding on our beach that will cause leaf damage. Um, we have mites um, and aphids. This last fall, we actually had, I got a lot of reports of um, beach blight aphids. They're also called boogie woogie aphids because they'll get all together. And when you startle them, they like to dance around um, and they're big and fluffy and white. And they excrete um, something called honeydew. So it's like their poop and it'll land on the ground and then mold will grow on that excrement and cause black areas on your, on your soil and your, your grass. So I was getting a lot of reports about like weird black spots under it, but it was just these aphids that show up in the fall usually look a lot worse than they are, cause leaf damage. Hold on one second, you're getting the dogs to be quiet. I'm sorry. Um, so the, this other damage from insects and diseases um, will cause leaf symptoms, but most of the time this looks really different. It's usually lighter in color or like browner in color, and it'll be a bit patchier. So beech leaf disease will always have these like solid stripes um, where these will be like patchier, like more scattered throughout the areas between the leaves. We also have um, beech bark disease present here in Massachusetts. So beech bark disease has been here since the the early 20th century. Um, it really peaked in decline in the late 
20th century. Uh, and it's caused by insects that feed on the bark will then introduce a fungus. Uh, and those funguses then cause these cankers. And as the cankers grow and spread, it'll girdle a tree. So we do have a lot of decline in our American beech forest caused by beech bark disease already, which is why we don't see as many beautiful, huge American beech. And we mostly see these really big European beech because they don't get beech bark disease. And I get tons and tons of questions from people that are, know they have beech leaf disease. Um, they wanna save their trees and ask what they can do. But at this time, we don't really have any good options for that. And there's, there's very little we can actually do for beech leaf disease. Um, and part of that was, is because it's a foliar nematode, which is something we, we've never had before. So we're starting from scratch. Um, things like when we got emerald ash borer, we have wood boring beetles that are really closely related to that here in the United States. So we already had the tools to combat that. We already knew what types of chemicals were how to get those chemicals into trees. But this is something where we don't really know what products would work, how we have to actually apply those, what the, the treatment timing and the rates would be for that. So it is a really slow process to actually research and figure that out. Um, and there's been some, some that do seem promising, um, but it's still kind of early to say like, yes, this is an officially approved treatment that can be used for it. Um, and other people are using polyphosphite. So it is um, a chemical that's used more as like a fertilizer and sometimes um, for canker diseases on trees and it's applied as a soil drench. But the, the studies for it were on trees that were about five inches in DBH. So a small tree like that is still like taking up huge amounts of nutrients, growing really fast. Um, so while it may be useful on your smaller trees and can protect them from it, uh, it might not work on, on a 200 year old tree that's a 40 inch diameter. It, and the, the, we don't know what the dosage between different sizes would be at this point. So people are trying it. I, I don't really encourage um, it. I, I've heard about companies coming through and selling their secret botanical options. And there are a lot of things that people are legally allowed to apply to trees that either it's a chemical that it falls under its label restrictions because it is approved for that type of tree and that type of thing. Um, or we do have products, they're called 22B products. So they're products that don't actually need a pesticide label because they are generally like inert. So it's people, things people use like around their homes or their own gardens, like garlic oil and rosemary oil. Um, so people will sell, they're just trying to make money, so they'll sell it to homeowners, um, but they're not actually impactful. And some of these people don't, they don't really understand how the disease works, um, and they're just trying to sell a product to someone um, that's just really desperate to try to protect their trees. So I, I don't encourage at this point any of the available treatments that people are, are proposing just because there's not, there's not a lot of research behind it. And sometimes things can be more harmful than they are good to our environment if we don't know what they're actually doing. Um, but things like, as I said before, it doesn't seem like it's assist, human movement assisted. So there's no restrictions on moving materials um, or cutting beach. I, I do like to encourage people when they, they do cut down a tree that does have disease or suspicious, suspicious um, insect or pathogen in it to try to use the wood locally, people that have wood stoves um, or, camp, or little campfires out in the back, keep your wood to burn it. Um, a lot of people that hire arborists, arborists um, and tree companies to come, a lot of times they'll chip, chip trees. And that's, that's really great at destroying a lot of um, insects and diseases we have. Uh, but there aren't any specific restrictions for, for beech leaf disease because we don't really know how it moves. We know it's present in the buds. We know it's present in the leaves, but we don't know if um, there are any actionable steps that could help reducing the risk of movement at this point. Um, I, I, it's hard because we, we don't know a lot about what's going on, but there is a lot of research going on. So it started out in Ohio. Um, their Cleveland Metro Parks have been really integrated in, in the on the ground research of figuring out what this disease was, um, how it's impacting our forests. So 
my team were working on regional efforts with our neighboring New England states on um, long term monitoring plots so identifying what impact this disease is going to have on our forest for the long term, identifying how quickly trees decline once they are impacted. Um, some of these sites, by the time we got there, we, it already had the disease and we don't know how long it had been there. Um, but some of our sites that we, we got in and started collecting data before it had beech leaf disease, so we'll be able to identify from when it gets the disease through, through losing trees. Um, but researchers are looking at the ways the disease is, is moving. Um, they've done some really funny projects with birds, so feeding birds um, buds that had nematodes in them and then trying to catch the birds and keep them in a bag until they poop and then test them to poop to see if it has nematodes in it. Um, but it's foresters doing this work, so they don't really handle birds a lot, so it was a little bit comical. Um, and then researchers are working on treatment options. Um, there's also like private companies um, that do treatments that sell pesticide products are also doing trials on, on treatments because this is, it is going to be big, big business and it's something that they want to be able to, to have available. So hopefully in the upcoming years, we'll have more answers. Um, it is, it, this is one of the hardest parts. We've been getting great public interest and outreach from this but it's really hard because I, I don't have a lot of great answers for people at this point um, to share besides being able to identify it um, and knowing that it is beech leaf disease impacting your trees. But um, if you guys have questions, I can stop sharing and we can ask some specifics. I have a question. Um, yeah. Hi, Nicole, thank you so much. I'm Susan Lee Anthony. I don't lately. I'm having trouble getting my um, video working. But anyway, um, yeah, I I don't have a beech tree on my property, but there's an absolutely gorgeous um, copper beech across the street. That even before I knew about beech leaf disease, I'd cringe because my neighbors across the street are parking under it. Okay, which drives me crazy, and um, they're not taking care of anything in the yard, but. Um, I got something from Bartlett, um, I don't know, a couple of months ago, and I'm pretty tight with my with my guy, um, with my Bartlett guy, and I immediately said, "Oh, you know, what 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 can you do?" Because it they made it, they sort of made it sound like um, there was something they could do about it, but he said, "No, not really. There's no cure," and um, but keep they do propose, it sounded as though they were proposing that if they injected the tree with some kind of vitamins or something that making it healthier, you know, pumping it up, like kind of like its immune system, um, that that would help. What do you, what do you think about that? So, I mean, maintaining a healthy tree does help it fight off diseases. So, Usually that's things like not parking your car under it, not hitting it with your lawnmower and snow plow. Um, and really a lot of the time reducing stressors is, is like one of the easiest ways to keep a tree right. healthy. Um, the, so the polyphosphite treatment is, it is more of like a, a fertilizer additional thing, not, not necessarily like a traditional pesticide. Um, so that may be what they're talking about and it, it has shown to, to help um, reduce nematode infection in trees, small trees. So um, that might be one of the options they're looking at. But um, some of the other things I don't, I am not fully on board. I do think that promoting the health of your tree is, is always beneficial. Um, but it sometimes with these really aggressive pathogens, it's, it's not going to make a huge difference. Would you, would you, if it were your tree, would you do that? Would you give it the polyphosphate, whatever it's called? I am, so I'm actually like a, I'm not a good example because like I had an ash tree in my yard and I was like, oh, I'm just going to cut it down. I'm not going to try to treat it, even though like I have my own pesticide license and I could have treated my own tree. I like cut my losses. So it is a personal I, I have choice. A big so ash tree. People... I have a big ash tree in my front yard and I do get it treated every year. Um, it's costing me a fortune. But um, anyway, all right. Well, I guess I'll have to ask somebody else, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs>
it is it is a personal choice um and but i do encourage like if people want to like try things um go for cool, it but once you start seeing like if you start seeing like big limbs die back and branches die back um i do encourage people to have trees removed once they do become hazardous and, okay. and kind of dangerous to your home and areas you're using well thank you very much i have a question yeah um, so you say the nematodes are in the buds. Um, so does that mean the damage has already occurred before the leaves emerge? Yep. Yeah. So they're in there causing damage when the leaves are like just forming in inside the buds. So um, yeah, once they start expanding and pushing out, they've already, it has already done. And actually like early in the summer when the leaves first come out, we, we can't find any adult nematodes at that point. So at the end of the summer in like August and September, they're everywhere. Then they're they're active in the buds, but then when the leaves first come out, we can't find them. Yeah, so the control will have to be to keep the nematode out of the buds to uh, prevent them from damaging next year's growth. Yeah, so it does look like we'll need something that's a systemic that'll get throughout the tree. Um, it doesn't look like anything that's like a foliar application will, will help. Okay. So, which makes it trickier too. Right. And I was thinking like a dormant oil pre-bud um, emergent, but if the, the damage has already occurred um, in the worlds of the undeveloped bud, then it's too late already. Yeah. And, and also, so different trees take up different products differently. So like MMX and benzoate um, is a systemic that we use for emerald ash borer. And it looked like it would be good it, it like in a lab test like it kills nematodes when they they touch the product um but beech trees don't actually they didn't they weren't taking it up very well and they weren't suitable for those injections of that product so it actually ended up not being a good treatment option okay thank you very much Nicole. very interesting nicole this is this is hampton and um i'm just trying to to figure out if, if there's nothing right now that we can do um, for our own beech trees, and, and I've got many, many of them as, as there are on pine woods, uh, I'm, I'm their next door neighbor. Um, one of the, the, uh, the questions that I've got is, is there anything specific that we can do to assist you and your team in in the the work that that you're trying to do to help improve the health of our forest and and in this specific case uh, with the beech leaf disease, I I don't think at this point just because in Plymouth it's that was like our epicenter so like we've we've really like gone through and like we've looked at all the trees in your town pretty much so we have a good grasp of kind of what's going on and. We do have some monitoring plots set up in town that we return to each year. Um, so unfortunately for you guys, we've we got there early, um, but we've, we've been really thankful to everyone in the community that's reached out and um, the, the town parks and conservation commission have been really helpful in, in letting us use their property to, to set up some of these, these plots. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so I have a question, but um, for those who have questions, if you could just use your hand uh, icon in the reaction sec um, section so that we can just keep track of who's next, that would be really helpful because I know everyone has a lot of questions. Um, my question is, um, in so since 2012, when it was first identified in Ohio, what has the impact been on those trees, especially the large ones, because it's been 10 years? Um, have they seen any trees recover on their own? Um, or has it been pretty much death to those trees? Um, you know, here at Pinewoods with 30 acres and we, you know, almost 30 acres and it's um, pretty much um, in the entire 30 acres, you, you know, like what should we expect? So, oh. In Ohio, they have, they have, they do typically when trees get the disease, they do continue to get worse and decline and they have seen mortality, um, but they've had sites that have had it for like 10 years now, but they still have trees and then some years don't look quite as worse. 
But out in Ohio, they don't have beach bark disease as prevalently as we do. So we have beach bark disease. Pretty much any beach you walk up to, will have, like you can at least find a couple of cankers on it. Um, and our soils are really different from out there as well. So it it seems like it's progressing a lot faster here. Like so, compared to what we're seeing here um, in Massachusetts, and then also in up in Maine and New Hampshire and their coastal areas it seems like we're getting it worse and it's progressing like a lot faster than they saw in Ohio because some of the trees we're seeing now are, are worse than Ohio's trees that have had it for 10 years out there so it's it's really hard to say but there are areas that still have it still look fine trees do look a little bit better they've never totally gotten rid of the disease once they have it um, but it seems that our conditions here are a little bit harsher so our trees are not faring as well. Thank you. Uh, David? You're on mute. Yeah. Nope. Gotta unmute, David. I thought I took it off. All right, you're yeah. there. I'm good. Um, I was just wondering if um, if there was a, a, a website or a way to report, like if, if we see it, like I know when, when there was a black bear running around, there was a website you could go, you know, to, I think it was a state site to report a bear sighting or like the, the journey north when you see the monarchs, you can report it. Is there, is there something similar to track the spread? Is anybody like collecting data that way? Um, people just email me and then I, I send oh, okay. my team out to investigate. <laughs> So um, yeah, we we were we didn't think it get that we didn't think it'd be so widespread so quickly. So we hadn't set up anything like that, and mm -hmm. we just get flooded with emails now. But and is know. it is it too late in the season with the the leaves changing and falling to to like say diagnose it or to, to spot it, or we got to kind of wait till the spring when the, the <laughs> leaves come out? Yeah, at this point, it's kind of. Um, Sometimes you can, so like beach, like especially younger beach, like love holding onto their leaves and you can kind of still see the symptoms, um, but it is a lot harder to tell this time of year. So <laughs> most of our reports now are kind of just queuing up to go back once, once spring to check them out. Thank you. Larry? Yes, hi, um, I'm a neighbor of Hamptons and I too have been working with Bartlett Tree and they have been actually doing an experiment on my property. They've identified a number of beech trees, large and small, and that they have basically tagged them with colored ribbons. Um, and one color basically represents a control group and the other color is a tree that they're spraying. And they have been spraying over the past five or six uh, months. And so, um, you know, as with all of you, I'm very much concerned about this, uh, this problem. And I can't tell you that they have any results yet, but as, as some of you may know, Bartlett Tree has their own laboratory, I believe in North Carolina. And um, so they seem to be in a position to more aggressively uh, deal with this problem. And I'd, I'd be curious to know whether Nicole is aware of this and, um, and whether there's any coordination between the groups that are that are dealing with this issue. Yeah, so groups like like Bartlett and Davey and Rainbow and ArborJet, um, they all do quite a bit of research. They, they, I mean, they have like some really great scientists on their staff, but it's it's kind of hard because they they also have like trade secrets, so they usually don't release a lot of their information out to us until it's um, they're ready to like go to market with things. Um, so it is kind of challenging. Um, so it, so we don't always know, like we do know that there's research trials in progress, but we don't always know how it's going until they're ready to either do it or pull the plug and not sell it. So, um, and also sometimes with these, these organizations, um, I mean, they do have an agenda to kind of push too. So I, I always take it with a grain of salt in my, in my role um, before kind of spreading that news out. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Caroline? 
Yeah, I was curious if, if there'd been any studies done on what happens if you, let's say you have a large stand of small saplings that are affected and you cut them all down to the ground. Do other species come in and take their place or do they, do they re-sprout with the same nematode? I think it's it's been too early to, I know that, um, like I know in New York, they, they did some sites where they were like, okay, what if we cut out the infested trees? Will it make a difference? Um, and it didn't, they, they did just have it, but it, um, they, they're still too early to see if they, they start getting like root sprouts or other seedlings coming up. Um, so some of it is just, we're still a little too early to know if the beach will come back or what species will replace it. And we also have a risk of like, we have a lot of invasives on our landscape here in Massachusetts. So having some invasive plants that we don't want to come in kind of sneaking sneaking their way into some of these openings as well. So if you have a large stand on your property, you know, an acre or so, um, would you suggest just leaving them as is or, or take, take them out? I'd say as long as you don't need, so some people are like manage woodlots for income and things like that. And if you don't need the, the wood for that, um, I'd say just, just leave them at this point because it's um, reducing the amount in the landscape is not going to decrease the amount of infection or stop the spread at this point. Um, but leaving them, there might be trees that recover. There might be trees that do show some resistance, which we're always, when we have a new disease on the landscape with something we're always looking for. Thank you. Uh, Susan? Oh my, was there somebody else before me? No? Um, I kind of have this sort of a similar question. I just wondered what the impact um, um, would be um, after the loss of a lot of the beach um, and how it might affect the overall balance of the rest of the forest and you know is that does anybody have any idea how that might go it's we we do know what happens sometimes when beach are removed um but i will say so some people are like real doom and gloom about things um but i will say like we've lost other trees on our landscape we have like highly disturbed areas um, but our forests like to grow trees, like in here in New England, like we plant a lot of trees, but we don't have to, like trees will grow. It's, we have the conditions for trees to grow. So there will always be trees and there'll always be forests. They might just look different than what we know and have now. Um, and I mean, beach, beach are, are an important part. They, they do house a lot of birds and wildlife, um, utilize them. They provide quite a lot of shade in certain areas. So some of that may, it may change and influence other populations and species, but we will still have trees and we'll still have a forest. Okay, end. thank you. Katie? Yeah, um, Susan, I had that question too. So my next question is, if we are losing trees, um, is there, are there particular species that would be good to try to intentionally bring into the forest? I mean, I know we want to try not to get introduce, let invasives be introduced. And, um, but thinking about the role that beech trees play in the forest, are there good alternatives to be thinking about? Uh, that's also like a tricky one that some of it comes down to like um, different people's like opinions on it because, um, so when you're planting trees, like you're bringing trees that were like grown in a nursery and under certain conditions that might have like different funguses and bacteria and insects and diseases um, so sometimes it's not always valuable to plant trees when we do have forests that produce trees there are sometimes smaller this kind of falls into some of Jim's Jim's world of um, resource management and follow-up after cuts and like long-term management of your forest and planning um, but most of the time there's not in this area there's not a huge need to plant and we we've had beach we've had beach bark disease here for decades and like in the 70s and 80s we were losing a lot of mature beach in in a lot of our state so we've kind of gone through parts areas where we have kind of lost trees and now now the trees we have are kind of that secondary growth that we might lose again 
So it's not totally unknown to our forests as well, but I'm in, I'm not always a huge proponent of planting just for the sake of getting, putting a tree in the ground. <laughs> Jim? So yeah, I, I mean, I was shaking my head at some of that as well. And I mean, I, I shared uh, this with you, Chris, as uh, when we visited, I think there's, um, if possible, you know, the genetic diversity of the beaches. I think, you know, leaving beach, uh, because there's not a lot of active work we can do right now, um, trying to keep our trees healthy, but leaving beach out there because we, we don't know the genetic diversity of the species. So, you know, we might have trees that are resistant and so, going out too quickly and cutting like they did with say chestnut blight, you know, maybe that's actually removing, you know, that one tree that would have, would help repopulate or be more resistant. So, so I think the genetics are important. I think maintaining a diverse forest. So looking at what other trees are naturally occurring in your forest and, and um, you know, bringing them along again, I think that the trees that naturally occur are going to be the ones that are adapted to the site. So just recognizing the diversity of the understory species as well. So you're kind of planning for worst case scenario and then really looking at each individual tree from a hazard standpoint, because if trees get bad enough where you have dead limbs or dead tops in them and they're, they're over a target, i.e. your yard or where you park your car, things like that, then I think you have to consider it you know, from, a, from a human standpoint, from a you know, health and safety standpoint. So I think that's the way to approach it. Um, you know, maintain the diversity of the forest um, hope you got some good genetics out there, you know, for the whole community and, and assess individual trees for hazard as, as time progresses. Um, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, uh, but understand that there, we're probably looking at, especially in the area of six ponds, some, some change coming in the, in the near future. So. Thank you. You know, Aaron Marcus, um, who uh, works for the state of Vermont, uh, has a few pictures that he wanted to share. Um, and I did see on your map that it has been identified in Vermont. Is that right, Nicole? And Aaron, feel free, you should have screen sharing um, ability. Thanks. Um, I don't think it's been documented in Vermont yet. That's actually why I'm asking, but it may have been in just the last couple months. I have, I just actually met with my counterpart from Vermont last week and they said they haven't found it yet. So, okay. Would, well, I'm sure would love the information if. Um, well, I don't know if this, it was just, a, I mean, it's really just that I don't know what, I don't know my beach diseases. So um, yeah, you can share that picture. Um, if you can share that, that'd be great. Um, can you share it on your end or? Let me just give me a minute. Okay. Keep going on and I'll see if I can do it. Let me see if I can. I don't see the, yeah, oh, there it is. Okay. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for Aaron to get the picture up, I did post my contact information in the chat. Um, so um, you, know, you don't have to bother Nicole in terms of identifying uh, the disease on your property or individual tree assessments if you want to know, you know, has or talk about other species that might might be adapted for your your landscape. Um, feel free to contact me. Did that work? Yeah. yeah. So just from that picture, I, I don't, it does not look like beach leaf disease. Excellent. Um, That's what I was sometimes about. you can have other things and beach leaf disease hiding in there as well. Um, usually it's best like, so for anyone that's kind of looking and trying to figure it out, um, it's a lot easier if you're under your leaves looking up for beach leaf disease um, and, and taking pictures that way too. But um, this, like, since it's kind of from the edges in and like curled and, and lighter in color, that's usually from some of the other insects that damage the leaves. Okay. Well, that's what I assume when I was out there, but I didn't see a picture of this as like the other species. So I just wanted to make sure. Thank you.
Um, Jim, we don't see your um, info in the chat, um, mm -hmm. but we can certainly send it out to um, anyone. We can um, provide the information um, in our newsletters. Um, okay. And I see the problem that uh, I didn't put it to everyone. So let me just redo that really quickly. Okay. Um, then it should be there. You should see it now. There it is. Okay. Yeah. Yes, got it. Thanks. Well, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Uh, it looks like Suzanne has a question. Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I just want to mention um it, because people are asking about planting new trees. Uh, I just want to mention I'm a, a professional horticulturist. Um that uh beach trees are generally grown, they're growing as a colony. So uh, Caroline asked a question if you cut down the sap, you're gonna most often you do. And if you cut a large tree down, you get a lot of saplings from root suckers. Um, so establishing new trees in the root zones of existing uh, beet trees can be quite difficult because there's an extensive root system. And um, and even just, uh, you know, digging by hand um, new root, new soil pockets for new trees would be difficult. So. Um, I just wanted to mention that from a cultivation standpoint that it can be very difficult to establish new trees in, in a beach forest, um, just so people don't waste their time and energy. And that's, that's my comment. And um, Jim, I think you explained when you were here at um, Pinewoods uh, that there are seeds in that soil um, and that hopefully some of those would take hold. I think, Nicole, you mentioned this as well, that something else is going to grow. It just will depend on how long it takes. And, you know, I think what we had talked about is just the area where um, on the steep banks um, on the Long Pond side, that that could be a potential area that we would really want to keep an eye out for. Um, Larry, Larry, do you have a question? Is your hand raised there, I think? I do. Um, where will this uh, recording be available from so that this discussion could be shared with others? Sure, so great question. Um, it will get loaded onto the Pinewoods Camp uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and then once we have the link, we'll send it over to Six Ponds. It'll be also on the Pinewoods website uh, and then um, uh, it'll go out on our newsletter. So I believe Caroline uh, and Hampton are planning on putting that and Suzanne are planning on putting that uh, in the newsletter uh, and sending it out to everyone, but it'll be in multiple locations. Okay, thank you. It, it will indeed, and thank you. Uh, it's, it's good to get the information out. Uh, and I just, if, are there any other questions? Oh, there was one. Ed, yeah, it looks like Ed has a question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Are nematodes common to other species diseases? And if so, what's to be learned about control in, uh, in other tree worlds or other animal, other worlds? Um, so nematodes, they're not like, Infections from them aren't, they're not common in like trees really that much at all. Um, but in some of our crops, we, we have them. So there are products um, that are used in crops in like agricultural settings for nematode control. Um, but the way you like grow crops and turn over and how like crops, like a lot of our production is really fast paced. Um, and it, it's kind of these things that aren't as long lived and slow as a tree, which, which is where some of this issue has been coming into play. Because um, there are a few products um, that do, that are like mixed use nematode products. Um, like, I, I can't remember, like fluopyrim is, is one of the common uh, active ingredients, but 
they, they still need to test and figure out how like can a tree take it up can it, it get into the right places in time and, and all of that kind of work but I think this is a learning experience for people in, in the forestry world um, kind of for a disease that's kind of outside of what, what's the normal um, even things like like fungal diseases are still really challenging to address and knowing that there are other things like this and viruses and, and more elusive kind of diseases that can impact our trees. Um, but I think one of the biggest, the best takeaways was it took them five years to figure this out and figure out what it was. I think if a similar disease came up again in the future, it would be a lot quicker to figure out what it is and identify that it is being caused by a nematode or being able to rule that out a lot faster because we have these tools and genetic markers and eDNA skills now that we didn't have at the start of this process. Thanks. Uh, Jim? I did want to make one other comment about um, as if trees do die in a forested area, you know, if you're, um, those are your trees, I mean, if they're not in a presenting a hazard, I would encourage people to leave them at all, you know, if all possible, because a dead tree's life and value is not over. It has a lot of other purposes to serve in terms of, habitat, um, you know, even when that log comes down and lays on the ground from a turtle standpoint and salamander standpoint. So again, if it's not a hazard from a carbon storage standpoint, so um, I would encourage you in the more uh, natural areas on your properties to, to, to do what you can to keep your trees healthy. But in worst case, if you do start to lose individual trees uh, to not cut them, if you don't have to cut them and let them serve out the rest of their, their lives, their purpose, I guess. Thanks. Susan? Yeah, just a real quick question. I came in just a little bit late, so you may have covered this before I came in. Where did they come from? It is not 100% known how they were introduced, um, but a, a DNA match for a nematode has been found in Japan on, mm, on beech trees there. Um, but it's it doesn't cause any of the symptoms. It's not like pathogenic on their trees there. And we don't know what the pathway or if we don't know if it could just be a really similarly related nematode um, that that does is pulling up the same DNA markers. But it likely is one was introduced. Um, we just don't know exactly how. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, I think it's uh, eight o'clock, which was kind of our goal. Um, so thank you, Nicole and Jim. Uh, and then Nicole, do you mind putting um, your information in the chat as well? Um, yes. And then folks can uh, reach out directly. And again, we hope to have uh, this um, presentation on our YouTube channel in the next week or uh, two, and then we'll get those links out to everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Six Ponds. Um, for hosting this uh, and in, including Pinewoods. Uh, we really appreciate it. As we know that uh, it is uh, definitely here in the Six Ponds area, so. Terrific, Chris, thank you very much. And I wanna say thanks, especially to, to Jim and super especially to Nicole. Uh, I, we, we appreciate the time and the work that you do. And I, I uh, would, would like to offer a special thanks and, and know that if there's anything that we can do to assist, if, if not with this one, with the next one, just please reach out, we're here. Thank you guys for having me. And yeah, I shared my contact information. If you ever have questions, um, feel free to ask and reach out. We'll and we'll again. make sure that we include um, their information, we'll incorporate it into the um, into the recording. Uh, we'll do some little editing and so on and so forth. So uh, thank you again and uh, have a great Thanks. night, everyone. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you so all. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye now. Thank, thank you. So you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.